Hey everyone, welcome to Keto and Crime. Today, just before we get back into part two of the Roman Catholic history with uh, the Dark Ages through the Renaissance, I thought I'd give you a little true crime palate cleanser. This is a case I actually covered all the way back in 2019. However, I've recut, re-edited, added some more footage. And this is a case that actually happened all the way back in the early 2000s, late 90s, though the roots of it go back much further than that. It happened in my neck of the woods in Appalachia, and it uh, shook our little community and the nation as well. If you cannot handle discussion of um, decomposing bodies, cremation, anything to do with the death sciences, then I would highly recommend you, you pass it on this video and wait for my next one. But with that being said, let's take a look at 2019 Tracy telling you about the late 90s, early 2000s case of the Tri-State Crematorium. Let's get in. Keto and crime, keto and crime, we uncover the crime on keto and crime. Keto and crime, keto and crime, now is the time for keto and crime. Hey everyone, Tracy here from Keto and Crime. Thank you so much to every single one of my patrons and channel members. You make this possible. And uh, you're one of the reasons I do this. And I thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And if I haven't said it before, thank you. I'll sing it. Thank you. Thank you for hanging in there with me and letting me geek out, not making fun of me like a lot of other people do because I like weird stuff about crime and dark history. Re, re. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. And, uh, and opening a sealed concrete vault, uh, we discovered uh, one concrete vault uh, stuffed or packed with more human remains. A large garage type building was found today filled to the top with decomposing human remains. Authorities have found five more vaults in other buildings and other vaults in the woods. So far, 92 sets of remains have been recovered only 16 of which have been identified. And some of these remains date back decades. And we have, I know we have found uh, some mummified bodies that I would easily say are between 10 and 20 years old as far as having been buried and then uh, you know, taking that long to get to this particular point. Authorities say most of the remains are from older people who died of natural causes, but some of them were only infants. We have found one definite set of infant remains though. And there are also some other areas that we are ex examining right now that appear to have uh, at least one small casket that would be an infant, infant type that has fallen apart. Just yesterday, Ray Brent Marsh was arrested on five warrants for theft body deception. But a magistrate judge has since released Marsh on a $25,000 bond. Authorities say as time goes by, more warrants will be taken, but body identification must be made first. Hey everyone, today we tackle a case that comes from my neck of the woods, woods northeast Alabama, eastern Tennessee, western Georgia area in the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, there are many, many times I am very proud to be from Appalachia, and then there are times like this one where I'm not, because this could only happen in Appalachia. But the scene you see in front of us is the scene right outside the former location of the Tri-State Crematory in Noble, Georgia. If you're actually from the area, though, it's Nobel, Georgia. <laughs> but Noble, Georgia, and what happened here is nothing less than the stuff of nightmares. So that's the reason for my little warning before. But if you're brave enough to hang in there, let's get to it. Let's get into it. Let's talk about the process of cremation because it's really important that we understand and why, why this may have happened. But as you all know, the process of cremation is breaking down of human remains by process of incineration. And it's not the quick process that a lot of people think. For those of you on here on YouTube, you can see the picture of the uh, two incinerators here to my left, your right, 
with the, the two caskets there. For those of you from Thought Crimes, if you simply Google cremation incinerator, you'll be able to find these pictures very easily. But let's talk about it. Cremation takes place in a couple of stages over about a four-hour period. Most incinerators cannot handle more than two bodies at a time. So you're talking about in a eight-hour period, about four bodies can be incinerated in one incinerator. So most crematories have multiple incinerators. So we may be up to maybe 16 bodies for your largest ones. But Tri-State was a fairly small one having only one of these incinerators. So that's important to remember. But the process of incineration happens in stages. And contrary to popular myth and belief, you cannot just light a body on fire and watch it burn. That's totally illegal. It's toxic. And I don't would never recommend you doing that. Most state regulations require that crematories use a container for the body. It's just sanitary and it prevents the remains from getting mixed up with the remains of other bodies so that you know when you receive grandma's urn or granddad's urn it's actually grandma or granddad. So all bodies have to be contained in a container usually a casket of some sort. Now the the best choices for cremation, the ones that I have heard most undertakers and morticians and crematory operators talk about, and I do Google that stuff because way back when I wanted to be a mortician. I'm very much into the macabre like that. But they re recommend they have to be a flammable, burnable material. Nothing fancy. You won't see them recommending metal $5,000 coffins because... First of all, they're hard to burn, and second of all, it gets mixed in with the uh, remains, and they literally have to take magnets and go over the remains to get the metal out because they can't give metal to the surviving family. So they recommend they be wood, so pine, plywood, and the best choice, a cardboard box, is what's normally used to house the bodies. The body is put into it and rolled into the incinerator. Incinerators usually come in two different sections. The first section is where the incineration actually happens. Most of these are propane or natural gas uh, fired. And most of the time, these first two chambers, which is where the main burning takes place, have a range in temperatures from 800 degrees Fahrenheit up to about 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. Some even creep up to about 1700, but 800 to 1200 degrees is the norm. And that's where the majority of the work takes place. It normally takes about four hours for a body to break down. It's not instantaneous. At ten, each 10 minute increment that it's in an incinerator, something else breaks down. The skin, the tissue, the bones, it happens in stages. So cremation is not a quick process. But once, but once the body is fully broken down, the next process begins. And in the secondary chamber of the incinerator, this is where you have all of the gases that are created with the propane or the natural gas burning down the bodies. All of those gases go into the second chamber of the incinerator, which kind of jacks those up to about 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, which destroys them and renders them safe to be propelled into the atmosphere. So most of these incinerators have basically a touchpad screen on the outside, so it literally tells the operator where they are in the stage. They're very high tech and have been so since the early 2000s with computerized screens and, and whatnot. So that's the process of, of cremation. It's not a quick process. You can't have a body completely broken down in 10 or 15 minutes. It takes about four hours to completely break it down. Once, these, once the process is done, it's allowed to cool. The bodies are brought out, each on its own individual tray, the remains. These remains are uh, basically moved into their own container. Magnets are passed over the remains to remove any metal that may be in there. And uh, they are then shaken, actually brushed into the family's container of choice. Most bodies after incineration contain about three pounds to five and a half pounds of 
ash. And once you have that, if it's not fine, which a lot of it isn't, most of the time you still have bone fragments, and if they had any sort of, you know, prosthetic, you know, like a knee replacement, all that stuff will be, the, be there, and that's the reason for the magnet. And then the rest of it is put into basically an incinerator. A, cream, a creamerator is what they actually call it, and it's like a blender that blends it down into the fine powder. It's then put back into the urn and given to the surviving family. Now, very important, all crema crematories are required to remove the following. Metal uh, fillings, cavity fillings, prior to 1992, required to remove that. Anything like a prosthetic limb that's on the outside must be removed. Breast implants have to be removed because that stuff will just end up a garbled mess and a mess that the crematory has to has to clean up and also the fumes from those can be quite toxic and even the the purification process that ha that happens in the secondary chamber can't really remove all the toxins from that so all of that stuff has to be removed before a body is cremated now with all that being said let's get into what happened at tri-state shall we tommy marsh who is a very respected businessman in Noble, Georgia, actually started Tri-State in 1976. And the reason it was called Tri-State is that he had contracts with funeral homes in three states, Alabama, Tennessee, and Georgia. And they all sent their bodies to him to be processed for burials. Not a lot of funeral homes, at least at this time, had their own crematory. So they had to basically send the bodies to somewhere else to be processed and then sent back. So he had a lot of contracts and we're processing, you know, a few hundred bodies a month because Tri-State only had one incinerator. So Tommy Marsh was very well respected. He ran for coroner uh, in the 80s, only losing by about 100 votes. So very respected. He and his wife had one son born about the time he started Tri-State named Ray Brent Marsh, who did not want anything to do with the death industry, with the funeral industry, with his father's business, dreamed of being a professional football player, and he was quite talented. Went on to college in Tennessee on a football scholarship and did quite well for himself. Until 1996, during his sophomore year of college, his dad, Tommy, got very, very sick with an unknown illness, was having a, basically a mental breakdown, along with a physical breakdown, and he basically asked his son to please come back and take over the family business so that it wouldn't be a loss because he had put his entire life into it. Begrudgingly, Ray Brent Marsh came back to Noble, Georgia from Tennessee and took over the crematory. Father and son worked from 1996 till this whole scandal broke in 2002 quite well together. They increased their the load of bodies coming in to you know, about 300 a month, and for a long time things went well, but Tommy Marsh, dad's, the dad's condition continued to deteriorate, and he became so sick that he was basically grounded from the business. So at that point, Ray Brent took over, and he did not hire any help. He did it all himself. That's mistake number one, not delegating, and basically ran the business for himself, by himself. Then, in 2002, trouble began to brew. January of 2002, a propane delivery driver who was delivering a normal order of propane to the crematory for the incinerator noticed something strange on the property. And we're talking about a couple of hundred acres here that this crematory sat on because not a lot of people want to live around a crematory, so they usually are on a pretty big property so that they're kind of by themselves, which makes a lot of sense. But he, del he was delivering his normal load of propane, and he said that he thought he saw body a body in a wooded area near the crematory. He didn't think much of it, made his delivery, went on. He thought he might have been mistaken. The next week, he's making another delivery of propane. This time, he see, still sees that body, and then he sees what he thinks is another, so he actually stops his truck, walks over, and sure enough, sees several bodies 
in various stages of decay in the wooded area around the crematory. He then, you know how that whole thing where you buy a car and then you notice that car everywhere? He began to notice things then out of place and he saw bodies in, in the ditches. He saw bodies here and it, it frightened him as it would. And he immediately went and after making his delivery and contacted Walker County Sheriff's Department saying he sees a couple dozen bodies on the Marsh property that do not look like their property stored. Could somebody please go out there? They actually sent a sheriff's deputy who did an inspection of the crematory, but not the property, and found that there was nothing out of place. Of course, this delivery driver continued to call the sheriff's department, complaining about it, and then residents around the area began to notice things while they were out walking their dogs, jogging. They started noticing bodies body parts, a strange smell around it, and they began to, in fact, one lady who was walking her dog said that the dog found a, a wrist, a hand bone from a human hand, and you can only imagine what that must have been like. But after all these reports started coming in, the Walker County Sheriff's Department called the federal EPA who came in and did a thorough inspection of the property and found close to 300 bodies scattered in various stages of decay in various places around the property. There were bodies in the woods, just lying on the ground. There were bodies in ditches. There were bodies stacked in the hearses. There were bodies around the back of the crematory. There, were a, there was a couple of bodies hanging out of the incinerator, partially uh, incinerated. Uh, there were, just think of the most macabre, think of the most macabre Vincent Price movie you can think of. That's what they saw. And they were from first stage of decay all the way to last stage of decay. And basically, in February, February 15th, 2002, they returned to the property after doing a thorough cleanup and found more bodies. They did a thorough cleanup of the first suite, went back in February, and found more remains because they uncovered hidden buildings on the property, storage sheds, vaults, things like that, with more and more human bodies. Altogether, 339 bodies were found that were intact. This does not account for the body parts, the decay, everything else. There could have been easily five, 600 bodies represented there on the property. Uh through dental records and records of people that had been sent there to be cremated, they were able to identify 226 of the 339 fully intact bodies. As they went on to investigate, Ray Brent Marsh confessed that he had been giving con that he had stopped incinerating about three months before, and because of an issue with the machine, he said the machine was having issues. He did not have the money to repair it, so he just thought he could kind of stave it off until he had the money to repair the machine, though upon inspection, state officials found that the, the incinerator was in working order. It wasn't in great shape, but it was in working order and could have easily incinerated the up to four, four to five bodies a day that a normal incinerator could have done. It just appears that he just, for whatever reason, went into a mania and stopped doing his job. So upon questioning him about what he had done about sending the ashes to all the funeral homes that he was contracted with, as well as to families that reached out to him individually to do their cremations. What was he giving them? Well, as we had said in our earlier informational segment, three to five and a half pounds of ash is normally what's expected. He was measuring out exactly three to five and a half pounds of ash, depending on the person's body weight, because you get all that information, and giving it to the funeral homes and the relatives, concrete dust. He was buying bags of concrete and giving them that instead. Just process that for a minute because it took me a minute. Uh, as the investigation went on, in late 2002, uh, Tommy Marsh, the father, who was pretty much in an avid state of dementia by that time, passed away. So it was just Ray Brent left to fend for himself. Uh, he hired McCracken Poston, and yes, you can laugh at that, because I did. 
as his attorney from Ringo, Georgia, who is a seasoned defense attorney and mounted a defense by reason of insanity. When it was all said and done, the state of Georgia charged Mr. Marsh with over 700 counts, including theft by deception for taking the money, not doing the services, abusing a corpse for obvious reasons, burial service fraud for other for obvious reasons, and giving false statements because he found that a lot of his initial testimony was a lie. So basically, it went to trial. And by 2004, when the trial concluded, now he was facing thousands of years for all of these, all of these charges. And the judge, and the, the judge was very lenient on him when he was found guilty and sentenced him to 12 years in state prison for this crime. Now, for some reason, the federal government decided not to charge him because they said that he was exhibiting a diminished mental capacity. So they just decided that the 12 years plus all of the obvious financial litigation that was going to come his way was probably punishment enough, as well as the shame that he would fight, that he would face. And their, their theory was very prophetic because a lawyer in Nashville mounted a class action lawsuit with 1,700 survivors of the 339 bodies. Now, during the period of 1996 to 2002, they estimated that the amount of bodies he brought in for cremation was just over 2,000 bodies and that 3,000 were found in fully, in, in fully, capacitate, fully intact state on the property. So he had basically had about half a year's worth of bodies not cremated. So he had actually done the work to cremate at least, you know, the rest of the bodies give or take with the ones that were in various states of decomposition that couldn't be identified as whole bodies. But we're going to say, be generous and say he probably cremated two thirds of what was sent to him. So along those lines, over 1700 people, those that were known because of their bodies of their relatives were identified to be relatives and those that had just sent bodies there that suspected that he may have you know, not done that, done his job in relation to their relatives. So in the end, you had 1,700 people in a class action lawsuit that sued Mr. Marsh and Tri-State Crematory for over $36 million. The initial settlement was reached in 2004 with Tri-State's insurer, which was a Farm Bureau of Georgia, that agreed to settle for $3.5 million. However, that was mainly for the residents of Georgia. Now, those that were in Alabama and Tennessee were not exactly satisfied with the set, with the settlement, so they pushed it. They pushed it, and it eventually went up as high as the uh, state Supreme Court, in which they were awarded $18 million, or actually they were awarded $80 million, excuse me, with punitive damages and everything else, but that judgment was set aside, and in the end, Georgia Farm Bureau agreed to pay the victims $18 million dollars and then there was another dispute over how that would be distributed initially the funeral homes that had sent bodies there were compensated so they can compensate their families and then after that the individual families were compensated so think about it 1700 plaintiffs 18 million dollars after the lawyer gets their fee each one's going to get you know a sizable five-figure settlement so that's how that ended uh, also in 2004 Georgia Supreme Court heard uh, Ray Marsh's criminal appeal in which it was denied and they upheld his entire 12 year sentence and he served the entire 12 years being released in 2016 finally. And he did write a letter of apology to the residents of the state of Georgia, Alabama and Tennessee to those he had wronged. Let's read that and then we're gonna talk about some other things. To my community, I humbly and very respectfully acknowledge the hurt and pain my actions have caused. I sincerely apologize. Moving forward, I can assure everyone that my life and deeds will not only prove the sincerity of my words, but my desire to lead a life that is worthy of this community. I am thankful to so many who have welcomed me home, wished me well, prayed for me, and are giving me an opportunity to redeem myself and my family with this community. While in prison, Ray Britt Marsh underwent a full psychiatric evaluation and medical exam. In 2007, the results of that were released and it found 
that he had about 500 times the normal level of mercury in his body, which meant that he had basically gone mad as a hatter because he was cutting corners in the doing of his job. He was not removing the things that most crematory operators recommend that you remove, such as the fillings, prosthetic you know, limbs, breast implants, what have you. And he had literally, both him and his dad, which may have been one reason his dad got so sick, that perhaps his dad was doing the same thing, and this is where Ray Brent learned it from Tommy, to cut corners. The two were definitely exposed and were the victims of merc mercury poisoning, which literally, they said, caused him to go mad as a hatter, and that's why he made the choice he did to do what he did with the bodies when he couldn't fulfill his obligations. And whether or not you believe that, that is what the the medical exam revealed, that he still served his entire sentence, whether you think it was too light or what have you. There is Marsh returned home today, Hannah. Calvin, Latricia, this is where the Tri-State Crematory used to operate. It's just off of a back road off Highway 27, and this is where Brent Marsh's mother lives. It's where he returned today. After 12 years behind bars, this is the first time Brent Marsh returned to the place where investigators worked for weeks, recovering human remains. This a source of pain for many who had a loved one sent to the crematory here. It just brings up like a flood of images to my mind, like how that time went after they found out. Alan Murphy's grandmother's remains were never identified after her death in 2000. You wonder what could you have done as a family member to protect the body of your loved one. Marsh didn't say a word today. His lawyer, McCracken Poston, spoke instead. Brent never complained. He never whined. He never asked, well, why, why aren't you getting me out on parole? Murphy is an attorney. He filed the first lawsuit against the Marsh family and ended up representing around 18 hundred people in a federal class action suit naming the marshes and the funeral homes that sent bodies here. One of the depositions was a man who had been released from prison to die of AIDS at home, you know, in a trailer. And the other one would be a judge from Chattanooga, you know, or the, a partner in a law firm or some of the wealthiest people. While Alan says he doesn't think Marsh is a threat to society, he says he understands why people are so upset he's out of prison. Yeah, I don't know if there's a punishment for something that hideous, you know, and that kind of cold hearted. But I, guess I think that there's 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 a mental illness component to this that 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 was probably not well addressed by the lawsuits or the, or the criminal punishment for that matter. That's that was the outcome. But there were conditions to his release. He must repay all of his fines and costs and surcharges within his release. There he owns some retribution to the insurance company. He owns court costs, lawyer's fees. He must begin to repay that within one year of his release. He must write a letter of apology to a designated representative for each of the identified bodies, which means that in addition to that letter, he wrote to the state of Georgia and his community. He also had to write a similar letter to all of the, his victims' families. Again, he also wrote the letter of apology to the community. He must do that within six months, which he did. He may not profit directly or indirectly from this case, so he can't do a book deal. He can't get any royalties off movies or any of the TV shows it's been based off of because there have been several episodes of Law and & Order and Criminal Minds that have been based off of this case. Well, Ray Brent Marsh got nothing of that, and if he does receive a payment, that he owes the state of Georgia $8 million. And he will be on probation until all his fines are paid. So he's going to be paying for this for several years. Uh, most experts say that it'll take him about 10 years to repay everything. So he's going to have a very miserable life, not to mention the humiliation. And suffering the effects of mercury poisoning isn't exactly a fun thing to do. So that's the story of Tri-State Cre uh, Crematory. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for those of you listening on Thought Crimes. I really, really appreciate it. Please share. For those of you that are listening, please feel free to leave a voice message through the Anchor.fm app or the Anchor.fm website where you can play my podcast because I am in seven different places 
Anchor FM, Spotify, Podster, RSS, lots of different places, Apple Podcasts, Pod at, Podcast Addicts, lots of different places I'm out there. If you go to anchor.fm tra- slash Tracy Barkley, you'll see all the places that I am. And if you are on anchor.fm, please feel free to leave a voice message. There's an app right there for you to be able to do that, and I'll place some of them online for you. So, really appreciate that. For those of you here on YouTube, please like, comment, share, subscribe, because I don't know if you know that there's another ad apocalypse coming down. So, if you want to donate to my Patreon or any of the other places down below that you can, listen to my album, buy some merch, always really appreciated because... As a true crime channel that's already heavily demonetized, I see that my channel becoming mostly demonetized after the new regulations hit in December. So, as always, I will continue to do this. Thank you so much. And I'll see you next time. Keto Comic, out.